And our next speaker is Connor on the dark substructure sensitivity in the Euclid survey with machine learning. Please. Hello? Okay. Yeah. I'll start again. Uh, so I'm Conor Ridden. I'm a postdoc at the Max Planck Institute for Astrophysics. Uh, and in our group, we search for dark matter subhalos inside strong gravitational lenses. Um, so why is that important? Um, well, it's a prediction of CDM that there should be a population of low mass dark matter subhalos in and around the main halos of galaxies. Um, and basically the distribution of these halos uh, in terms of mass um, depends exactly on the dark matter model. So as you move away from CDM, which is the, uh, the blue line here, so this is the expected number of subhalos as a function of mass. As you move away from CDM, you go to a warmer model or, or a lower mass particle. Um, you start to see a suppression of, of substructure formation below a certain mass. So measuring this function in the universe um, gives us a constraint on the dark matter model. So the way that we do that in our group is with a technique called gravitational imaging. So this is some example, uh, a Mark HST uh, strong lens image. So you can see these are the, the strongly lensed images here. Um, and then the black dots are the positions of subhalos, low mass subhalos. Um, and what we do essentially is model the strong lens um, in a similar way that, that we, we've talked about already a bit this week. Um, and then look at the residuals between the smooth model uh, and the data and look for the signal of these subhalos. So if there are subhalos present near to the images, they'll leave this sort of very distinctive kind of tidal magnification effect across the, across the lensed images. Um, but to do this uh, is a very intensive process in terms of computation time uh, and investigator time. Not only do you have to do the smooth lens modeling, um, is then a, a very involved process to actually detect or not detect uh, the subhalos afterwards. Um, so another bit of context, we've, we've talked about these numbers a lot as well this week. Um, we're on the edge of an explosion uh, in the number of known strong lenses. Uh, and in our group, we're especially interested in the Euclid data because the resolution will be good enough to, to perhaps do um, gravitational imaging rather than um, in the other surveys, uh, although they'll find a lot of lenses, that'll be useful for following up and, and, and getting the data to do the gravitational imaging, but it might be possible in the Euclid data itself. Um, so we have this uh, combination of a very intensive, expensive technique uh, and an awful lot of data to do it on. And so you can see where machine learning is gonna be useful here. Uh, I'm only gonna talk about this second approach today, although we are working on both. Um, and so essentially this is looking at can we replace or approximate the traditionally expensive method for modeling the substructure uh, with something much quicker, machine learning based, so that we can just get through as much Euclid data as possible um, and put constraints on the dark matter model that way. Uh, so the approach here is, is very simple. Uh, we basically use ResNet in, in a few different sizes to just classify uh, for now just a binary case um, of whether there is a subhalo in an image or not. Um, so it's very simple, you basically just get class probabilities uh, for both cases. Um, and here I'm just showing some initial testing basically on uh, very, very simple mock data, mock lensing data. Um, and so these use parametric sources, so the, the images are very smooth, but you can see the accuracy is, is very, very good. Um, there's a slight degradation once you increase the complexity of the source here, which you'd expect um, because of this, the type of signal that you get from a subhalo. So, so these two mock images, uh, the red dot there is a, is a subhalo, and then these are the residuals between the smooth model and the model with substructure. Um, 
and you can see again this kind of difference in magnification across the images. Um, and you can imagine that once you add noise, a PSF, uh, and a complicated source that isn't just a smooth search profile, um, you can see how the source might actually absorb some of this signal once you do the modeling. Um, so it's very important in, in creating this training data that you do use realistic sources, um, and, that, and that significantly uh, improves the accuracy in terms of real data. Um, so we've talked a lot about uh, interpretability, so I thought I'd just include this. Um, so this is the, the activation map, basically from some of the kernels, not all of them, uh, in the first layer trained on that uh, simple data at the beginning. Um, and you can start to see something that resembles, you know, the network is looking for things that, that we would also look for in, in those images. So a lot of the kernels basically just mask the background in the image, which is obviously useful. But then some of them, you know, this one, for example, this one, and this one, and combinations of these, you can start to see are trying to pick up uh, on these kind of differences in magnifications across the images rather than just finding the images themselves. Um, so at least in this first layer, uh, what the network is doing is, is similar to what we would do when we're, when we're staring at the residuals uh, from the smooth models. So now onto our training data. This is just a sample of, of some of the Euclid lenses that we're using. Um, and so we use Hubble Deep Field Sources and we have a pipeline which self-consistently samples uh, realistic lens and source configurations, redshifts, magnitudes, etc. Um, and then we make a, a signal to noise cut at 20. Um, and so these are, these are the kind of images that we train on. And so in terms of Euclid, um, we use about a million of these images in training. Um, and now we're adding subhalos basically over, over this mass range. So 10 to the 9 up to 10 to the 11 solar masses. Uh, and from HST, this is the kind of mass range that we expect Euclid to be sensitive to in terms of uh, subhalo signals. Um, so the performance on this was quite good. So I actually expanded the mass range very slightly by, by half a decade on either side. And this is to make sure that, that we're actually getting to the, to the limits of what Euclid data will be able to pick up on. Um, and the final accuracy here on the testing data was 84%, and that number will come up again later on. Um, so now we, we can start to actually put this in a physical context. If we just take a very simple statistic from the output of the network, so that's this basically the log odds ratio um, of the probabilities between the two classes. So for an image that does have a subhalo, the class is one, uh, any image with, with this statistic greater than zero is a, is a correct prediction. Um, and then we bin all of the images by their subhalo mass, and we look at the distribution of that statistic um, in those bins. Uh, and so this starts to give you an idea of how sensitive Euclid will be to the signal of, of dark matter subhalos, um, marginalized over the source structure, the configuration, the signal to noise ratio, et cetera. Uh, and so we're working on exactly how to, um, how to you know, put a, a distinctive threshold on this. Um, but you can certainly say the sensitivity is, is somewhere in this range between 10 to the 9.5, 10 to the 10 uh, solar masses. So by 10 to the 10, uh, you're correctly finding the subhalo 90% of the time. So if we want to get an idea of what kind of mass functions we could rule out or confirm with Euclid data, we need to expand the problem slightly because in a real mass function there are multiple subhalos or there's a probability of being multiple subhalos per image. Uh, and so now we train the network to classify images based on uh, their total mass in substructure according to these labels. So five bins for mass, uh, an extra bin for no mass at all. Um, and now we're looking at can we use these more complicated models and still do the simpler binary classification task with the same model as before. Um, and also because we're interested in how sensitive the Euclid data is to the subhalo mass, we need to make sure that the model we're using is actually complicated enough to do this. So we're being limited by the data and, and not by the model. Um, so that's the first thing to look at. Originally in the binary classification, we used ResNet 18. Um, and in testing, ResNet 50 outperformed this very quickly on the more complicated multiple classification. Uh, so we switched again to ResNet 100. 
Um, and you can see there's very little gain in accuracy between these two. So we're confident that, that as not, at ResNet 50, um, you're pretty much at the limit of, of the sensitivity to that subhalo signal. So that's a model we can go forward with. And then in terms of the different bin classifications, you can see that uh, training with five mass bins or then dividing those mass bins again in two, training another model, and then using it to classify um, the data in five bins is just as good as a model trained to just do five bins. Uh, and if you remember before, in the binary task, we got 84% accuracy. And so if you collapse those bins again, just into the, the possibility of mass or no mass, uh, again, you achieve the same accuracy. So you can basically use the most complicated model and carry on training with that. And if you need to, you can still reduce the task at the end to, to that simpler version. So in conclusion, um, we know that Euclid can detect subhalos uh, of around 10 to the 10 solar masses. Um, smaller masses might be possible, uh, but we need to basically calibrate this against the well-defined detection threshold that we have uh, in the traditional method. Um, I didn't get time to show a plot, but that sort of curve of sensitivity is very similar uh, when you actually use the multiple bins and you're classifying multiple substructures in terms of total mass. Um, and then looking at the output of the network for training sets or testing sets with different mass functions in um, will give us a sense of how many Euclid strong lenses we would need to, for example, rule out CDM. Um, and another nice result is that uh, we can train much more complex models to do complex tasks uh, and they still perform just as well as the simpler models trained to do the simpler tasks on those tasks. Uh, so that's all, and I'll take any questions. Thank you. Questions? Here, or in the cyber, yeah, we have. On Slack. Um, I should read it? Okay. It's from Jenny Wagner. A lens model with subhalos has an increased number of degeneracies. Physically, we know how to break them. How does the natural network handle them? In bracket, e.g., can you find out what subhalo model the neural network uses? Um, I'm not sure. That's, that's, that's the next step, really, um, is to find out how is it making these decisions? Um, and I've got a lot of ideas about that thanks to uh, the discussions we've had this week. But um, yeah, exactly. We know when we're doing lens modeling, um, we know physically what it means to detect or not detect a subhalo. Um, but yeah, as of yet, we, we don't know how the network is making those decisions. Really, all you can do is hope that you've got enough training data that's diverse enough that it's seen you know, multiple configurations of subhalos that all mimic the same signal, uh, and so you show it, you know, in that sense, the degeneracy, um, and you hope that you know, that's encoded then into the probabilities that it outputs, but uh, that's not something we've properly tested yet. Okay. More questions? Is Jenny happy with the answer? If not, I would propose we move on to the next talk. And so, please come back. <coughs> Someone, yeah. so, but first, uh, let's thank you again, Connor.